Risk <clears throat> is a risky business. It's a calculated balancing of failure and success, which necessarily leaves open the possibility of both. It was then momentarily surprising that in the autumn of 2008, the language of failure was employed with such careful ambivalence. The failure of neoliberal assumptions about the self-regulating market were both blatantly obvious and yet also became a careful defence of the status quo in the months immediately following the crisis. Alan Greenspan, for example, was asked by a Senate committee whether his view of the world, his ideology, was not right. And he was blunt. Absolutely, he said. Precisely. He was wrong. Yet this candour could be taken to suggest neither accountability nor the possibility that change was necessary. It was a once-in-a-century credit tsunami, he suggested, and whatever regulatory changes will be made will pale in comparison to the changes already evident in today's markets. So by October 2008, Greenspan was saying the markets have already, have already corrected, they've already responded to this crisis, they've already learned their lesson, we don't need any regulation. The logic that accepts failure but denies its consequences found its fullest form in the ubiquitous language in the phrase of the crisis which was too big to fail. Banks bloated asset sheets were both the cause of their failure and the thing that necessitated their unquestioning rescue, the reason that we couldn't ask what was happening. So there was a failure of failure that attended the riskless risks of finance. And I think this offers one kind of explanation for the otherwise kind of rather painful and ironical fact that it is those on the left that have begun to identify themselves with the language of failure since the crisis. And I've got, I've got some slides. Let me just hang on. OK, let me go back. So elegant. OK. In 2011, Richard Deintz, for example, gestured to a critical tradition of failure, suggesting that as opposed to the more coolly conceptual notions of dominance and hegemony, the notions of defeat and failure never lose their unsettling sting. One must be able to go through defeat without saving anything and to go through failure without losing everything. And excluding such words from our vocabulary would leave us nothing to do but jostle for a better place in that triumphal procession already underway. And I think I, I'm not quite sure what Dyntz means, means by this. So I think it's trying to think about what this means that I'm going to do in this paper. It wasn't only Dyntz who was thinking about failure um, in... in I'm going to leave that one up. In 2011, the Review of Contemporary Fiction published an issue dedicated to failure. It represented literary failure as a painful form of freedom, an ongoingness in a kind of uh, a rephrasing of Samuel Beckett that allows works to pay exclusive attention to their own unfolding, allows works to be free from the demands of the market. The journal includes William Gaddis's English 241, A Literature of Failure, a reading list that the novelist taught at Bard in 1979. Gaddis' essay, The Rush to Second Place, which he originally tried to publish simply as a failure, but they wouldn't allow him, glosses the pedagogy behind this module. In it, Gaddis condemns America for accepting failure, the rush to second place, the lack of ambition, whilst emptying out its correspondence with what he calls the assertion of accountability. America produces, he says, only successful survivors. And he was well aware that financial crisis was one of the kind of paradigmatic examples of this. Gaddis wrote a lot about the savings and loan crisis in the 80s. The source book for Gaddis' novel, J.R., his second and most celebrated novel, is Norbert Weiner's 1950, The Human Use of Human Beings. And what I want to kind of suggest now is that Weiner provided Gaddis with something akin to a methodology for thinking about failure in ways that specifically spoke to the emergence of neoliberalism. And Weiner is a profoundly ambivalent figure. He's kind of thought of as the originator of cybernetics, and he drew that work from his wartime research, but he explicitly condemned the militarisation of knowledge immediately after the war. He developed the mathematical formula that made the quant revolution in finance possible, according to Robert Merton, but he also wrote caustically about financialization from the 50s onwards. So Weiner both kind of contributed to the uh, militarised logic of risk management that Randy Martin describes, but he also condemns its implications. He suggests another kind of resistant trajectory for this thought that I want to follow through. And there's two kinds of arguments that I want to make to link together these three, these three figures. First of all, I want to think about Weiner. I want to think about Weiner's relationship to neoliberalism, and I want to do it by very briefly and quite schematically comparing him to Friedman, uh, to think about what they had in common and where they diverged. So what I'm missing out here is, is Weiner's own writing about, about economics, um, which are kind of interesting. And then I want to examine how, how this kind of Weiner that I'm trying to make evident appears in Gaddis as a way of thinking about failure. Okay. Um, 
Um, this is a slide that shows the naval operations research at Columbia, where neither Friedman nor Weiner worked. So that's helpful. Um, but what it does show, they both worked at the military operations research at Columbia. So I imagine they look really, really similar. And sometimes the internet fails one the day before a slide. And I wanted to see just a second. What I really wanted is a picture of, of Weiner and Friedman kind of holding hands or leaning on each other. But their, their relationship was loose, let's say that. Okay, so they both worked for the University of Columbia Statistical Research Grouping. And Philip Morosky in um, Machine Dreams has suggested that this, that this formed the kind of nucleus of the Chicago school in the post-war period. So Weiner and Friedman were both there together. They were both doing statistical research on anti-aircraft ordnance. They were working out how to make... Um, how to make this machine gun fire more effective. Both are expansive and post-war moment about their roles in a new kind of science-led world and their assumptions regarding the generalised applicability of their research. And both were accused of being scientific imperialists in that moment as well. Their confidence was grounded in a shared commitment to the rational subject, formed through a continuous dialogue with empirical evidence and, and possessing predictive capacities of this knowledge. And both published seminal work in the early 50s describing this methodology, but extrapolating very different implications from it. So that is very nice. That's Norbert Weiner's The Human Use of Human Beings, Cybernetics in Society, 1950. And Weiner was interested in the parallels between the feedback mechanisms of early computers and the mind of the living individual. And his thesis is that in both of them, their performed action on the outer world, and not merely their intended action, is reported back to the central regulatory apparatus. So the biological individuality of an organism seems to lie in a certain continuity of process, Weiner suggests, and in the memory by the organism of the effects of its past development. It can learn, it can predict the future from what it already knows. Friedman's a nicer cover in some ways. Friedman's 1953 Essays in Positive Economics, um, which contained his most kind of infamous essay of this period, Utility Analysis of Choices Involving Risk, describes his, method his methodological aim. It was to provide a system of generalizations that can be used to make correct, correct predictions about the consequence of any change in circumstances. Its performance is to be judged by the precision, scope, and conformity with experience of the predictions it yields. Yet, the two men, so they're kind of, I mean, it's kind of schematic. I'm not suggesting they came from the same place. I'm suggesting they came from a certain kind of moment and that they drew different things from that moment. They framed their methodologies in very different ways. Friedman assumed that his model which gave a successful answer to a kind of closed question, was a stable and endlessly repeatable process. Um, this is what Philip Morosky has said about it. He describes it as a rough and ready pragmatism that, comes, that still has its roots in the wartime thinking of operations research. Assume repeated operations tend to a maximum of the function. Marvel at the extent to which large bodies of men and equipment behave in an astonishingly regular manner. Um, Treat the, the set of design, designated causes as comprising a closed system. So the kind of the, the kind of closeness of this, which always means that it, it achieves the results that it's meant to achieve, and astonishing, and it can be endlessly repeated. We can you know we can bracket off realism. We can bracket off anything that, that doesn't help us with that formula. Okay, um, Weiner's assumptions about this closed system, Weiner's assumptions about this kind of tautological model that they were given were entirely opposite. A system may lose order and regularity spontaneously, but it practically never gains it, he says. The measure of disorder is the positive logarithm of the probability. An isolated system will tend to a maximum of disorder. So Friedman's optimism and Weiner's pessimism more broadly diverged around their view of the capacity of science. Whereas Friedman was quick to claim his positive economics as akin to an objective science, he uses the language of natural selection to explain the actions of the businessman in that 53 essay, Weiner was fiercely critical of the category and fiercely critical of a two cultures division between science and the arts. He specifically rules what's happened to the arts, which has been commercialised and left, he has said, in the hands of entrepreneurs who cannot afford to take a risk, who cannot afford the possibility of failure. And it is a kind of um, an aesthetic or a cultural practice that is interested in the possibility of failure, that's willing to entertain failure, that I think that Gaddis is one of the things that Gaddis drew from Weiner. Um, Gaddis's novel, is it there? There it is. That's, um, is a novel that I think seems to be of our moment in lots of ways. It's been republished in 2012. One of the many um, uh, phenomena that came out of the um, Occupy movement was an Occupy Gaddis um, movement of a kind of online reading group of people trying to understand this text. It's a very kind of dense, complex um, text that, that resists the reader. Um, 
And the reason I think it seems to be about this moment is that it's interested in financialization, it's interested in entropy and failure, and it's interested in a kind of critique of the industrialization of the arts. And it draws all of these things from Weiner. But I'm just going to point to two things that I think it takes from Weiner that are useful for the contemporary moment. Um, JR is almost entirely constructed by unattributed dialogue. Um, I had this kind of moment, in, because I'd been working on finance before the crash, that lots of people would come up to me and say, well, what's the best novel about finance? And I'd always say, oh, JR. And then I'd have a wicked smile on my face as I knew I was leaving kind of archaeologists and, and people who came up to me in the cafe to read this novel that's almost impenetrable. It requires an enormous amount of kind of commitment to it, robust commitment, I think was the phrase at the beginning to make sense of this book. Okay, the difficulty in reading the novel, working out, this is a phrase from quite early on, working out who is who, what is happening, where we are, can be read as a kind of imitation, as a parody of positivism's emphasis on the primacy of experiential knowledge. We have to understand every single thing. We're not given any of the guidelines. The imagined world of realism isn't created for us here. The novel requires the reader to identify protagonists simply by their reported speech. Yet this speech itself indicates not the idiosyncrasies or the individualism of the speaker, but their reliance on pre-existing speech. As Joseph Tabai has noted, Gaddis uses the language of systems, office talk, depositions, press releases, legal judgments as his medium. And Tabai reads this through Nikolai Luhmann's systems theory, suggesting that they share an understanding of the self-exemplifying nature of any imposed order, the auto-poetic circularity of a closed system that gives the answers that it can define in the first place. It is this self-exemplifying and closed system, which also suggests Morosky's description of Friedman, of course, that Gaddis seeks to resist, to make absurd. He evokes entropy to produce chaos, and he renders this chaos itself a kind of critical resistance to the closed system. So what's happening at the beginning of the novel is we have the, the novel's um, kind of anti-hero, Edward Bast, um, isn't present, but we have a lawyer who's trying to d- establish his paternity and everything will flow from you know, who his father is. He doesn't know who his father is. So we've got these, his two confused aunts, seemingly confused, seemingly kind of doddering, responding to the lawyer. And it's not until we get to the end of that conversation between these two old women and the lawyer that we realise that their obfuscations have allowed Edward to escape and that somehow they were quite aware of doing that. Um, don't, I, don't I hear him now, your, your nephew coming down the stairs, Edward? Hammering Julia. Yes, is my favourite line. Yes, it couldn't be Edward. He left long ago, didn't he, Anne? I think I heard him leave when I was sewing that button on. He had class today, you know, Mr Cohen, at the Jewish temple, rehearsing Wagner. And the kind of knowingness of that last, the kind of irony of that last um, section suggests that the aunts always knew what they were doing um, when they were apparently just resisting him. And so what happens in that conversation is that this, this lawyer kind of spins this web of legalese around them that they can't enter into. They can't enter into that closed system because to affirm or, ne- or um, negate any of his questions is to participate in and somehow they would unwittingly give away the fact of his paternity. So they just resist him. They just give him kind of what looks like chaos but isn't chaos. And they mishear him. It's really, really important in the novel. The misfiring is where Gaddis' kind of satire in this text comes from. That's the kind of entropic nature that he turns that entropy, that, that, that failure, that, that loss of communication, into a kind of critique. It's not simply formal failure as resistance, though, that the novel offers. It's also concerned to trace an elliptical history of failure that I want to begin by gesturing towards. And this is quite kind of tentative new work that I'm trying to, trying to think through here. So Gaddis is interested, I think, as was deemed where I began, with realising failure as both accountability and possibility, this unsettling sting. And the novel is interested in the, fi- the simultaneous financialization of both education and the military. The eponymous J.R. is the schoolboy who's at the centre of the novel. His fantasy empire is created alongside an, an adult empire, Typhon International. And Typhon International has two kinds of deals going. One is with the military, um, and it's got this kind of... Com- quite clearly kind of um, neo-imperialist presence, and one is with schools. It's trying to get advertising into schools, um, which is where lots of the, the, the novel is set. And this um, quote is from a conversation between two Typhon international employees who are discussing bringing advertising into school. And again, we're never told who's talking. Um, we're never given any context for that conversation. This is really how the novel looks. Gum, cereal, candy bars, all that stuff and junk is the primary grades. Bikes, sports equipment, records, seventh and eight. Advanced algebra on deodorants, tampons and all that. Blah, blah, blah. Here's a cute one they just came up with for ninth grade algebra. Once the USDA opens up and the trademark's registered, smoky letters rising out of the grass. Here, see them? I'm Mary Jane, fly me. Gets the idea right across Skinner. Get that title page? Motto running right along here, under your Duncan and Skinner colophon, bringing the world into your classroom and the classroom into the world gimmick. 
dug out the name of this educator, Thomas Dewey, for the PW announcement of this children's encyclopedia, turned it into a crash project. Team of salesmen out blanketing the city with samples. A volume four, pulling enough orders for the set. We can go through the other nine, paying half a cent a word. All that ad space, bypass your little old lady at Shady Nook. Hit your educatable public right in the supermarket where they live. So what's going on here is they're imagining the ways in which they can make everything in that school branded. Um, and Gaddis is clearly kind of satirising it. So beyond the critique of this kind of familiar movement of capital that turns knowledge into a commodity and the commodity into a speculative device is a suggestive history of failure itself. The reference to Thomas Dewey, for example, seems to be a mistake. Thomas Dewey was not an educator at all. He was a lawyer, and he's a twice Republican presidential nominee in the 1940s. So as a signifier here, he seems to be the ultimate signifier for failure. He's the only man who's ever, been, who's ever failed to be elected president twice. Um, and behind him are other kinds of Jewies. Who, do we, who does he mean? Who is this other educator, Thomas Dewey? And there are other kinds of Jewies that it could be. So the two potential educators who were named Dewey, who appear in other ways in the novel and other ways in Gaddis's writing, um, suggests something about how Gaddis is imagining the relationship between failure and success and the way in which they create and invert one another. The most obvious Dewey is Melville Dewey of the Dewey Decimal Classification System. And this Dewey epitomises the idea that knowledge can be universally ordered for universal good. This hierarchy of knowledge is the one that the novel explicitly lectures against. He kind of appears in the novel um, as, as a kind of parody. And Melville Dewey's own biographer doesn't shy away from the prejudicial fault lines of his life and his work. So Dewey is a kind of failure and a kind of success for Gaddis. His commitment to liberal social reform, to the edu role of education, to the mass accessibility of the public library, look radical against the ideas of Typhon International that they're placed against. And they look radical today when schools that are failing at Ofsted are asked to turn to Tesco for governance um, in my local community. The other potential Dewey is John Dewey, the pragmatic philosopher and educational revolutionary who Gaddis remains very interested in throughout his writing. One of the timelines in Gaddis's kind of encyclopedic notes, for example, um, records that the same year that Thorndike published the first handbook on measurement in the social sciences and that 260,000 pianolas were built, that John Dewey came to join the philosophy department at Columbia revolutionising education, reflecting industrial development and the development of democracy. References to John Dewey appear in JR alongside those to literary activists, such as Jack London and Stephen Crane. And Dewey seems to be rep represented as both radical and compromised. He's part of a movement that allies education with democracy, always to the detriment of both, in Gaddis's view. And yet, in other ways, his, his views remain very close to Gaddis. He's also a success, and it's never clear how Gaddis is treating these two figures all these three figures. Um, a Dewey's defence of the New Deal, as Michael Slatsy has argued, his insistence that artistic labour offers nothing less than the last holdout against industrialisation, seems to be very close to Gaddis's own position. So Gaddis employs failure as a critique, as a resistance to a closed system that defines itself through the success of closure. But I think he also offers more than this formal resistance. And I think that's important kind of methodologically. He's also suggesting an historical trajectory for both success and failure. And what he's suggesting here is that we need to acknowledge the way in which one emerges from the other and we need to give back failure in particular its meaning. Thank you.